everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Hope Through Grief. I'm Steve Smelsky, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Marshall Adler. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well today. We've got a, a special show set up for you today. We've got a guest speaker coming in. He's a friend of ours, and I've gotten to know him. And I think you're going to enjoy his story and all of the different things that he's doing. Uh, Marshall, why don't I turn it back to you, and we'll... We'll start with our first question. Thank, thank you, Steve. Uh, Herb, first of all, I want to thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be a guest today. And before I start, I want to uh, tell our audience, you know Herb's a great guy because of before we uh, went on the air, Herb and I were reminiscing about both growing up in Buffalo, New York, which is the greatest city in the Western Hemisphere. So <laughs> any, anybody from Buffalo is a soft spot of my, soft spot of my heart, and, and Herb is a... Buffalo Bills fan like I am, so we're, I just want to get that on the record before we start. So, Herb, um, I do want to get serious here, and if you can please tell us your story and your journey of loss and grief, I think that'd be a good place to start. Okay, sure, and, and thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Um, my wife, uh, her name was Michelle, uh, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at the age of uh, 49, and that was 15 years ago, or almost almost 16. Um, so that started a 39-month journey of caregiving, uh, and I had a lot of help uh, from neighbors and such. Uh, she had to have 150 chemo treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so it cost me 300 lunches because they would go to lunch and the neighbors who escorted her to the treatment uh, so I could still go to my job. Um, and it was, it was difficult. I mean, I watched her fade away from a size 10 to an eight, to a six, to a four, to a two, to a zero over that 39 month span. Uh, she passed in March of 2008. And I'm a banker by trade, and we were new. Uh, I had accepted a position in San Antonio, Texas with a bank. And we were new, and we were just, we hadn't even emptied all of our boxes. And that's when she died. Mm -hmm. And so about four months later, I was in my office, and my routine was get up and be in the office by four, work like crazy all day and then go home at about seven and crash and that was my life that was the extent of it and one of my young employees came in my office i mean she's only about 19 years old but she had the courage to tell me something and she said everybody on the floor misses your laughter because i'm a pretty gregarious guy and I realized when she told me that, that I wasn't handling my grief well enough. So I decided to seek out help. Um, I went to my church and frankly, I was disappointed uh, because they didn't have anything, not even uh, a hotline number, not, not a flyer or brochure, they just, I, I find a tremendous number of churches are ill prepared to deal with grief, which really staggers me. I mean, it surprises me that the, uh, it, when people think of death, they think of their house of worship and they come together and, but the, the clergy just aren't prepared. They're not trained. In fact, in most uh, colleges, seminaries, they don't even teach grief. It's not even on the curriculum. So anyhow, I, I learned that after the fact. Then I went to the Veterans Administration because I'm a disabled vet, and they assigned a counselor to me, which was helpful. But then I went to Barnes & Noble, and I asked the gentleman behind the counter, uh, do you have anything for a widower? Well, he typed widower in his computer search engine. He then looked up at me, and he said, Mr. I don't have a damn thing for you. Wow. Now he said, let's go over to the bookcase and see what we can find. 
and he, we found 15 books all written for widows. And he said, some of the chapters may apply to you, but I don't have a book for widowers. Well, I had been published in the past, and I decided right there and then that I was going to write a book. I said, someone better write this book, and it might as well be me. So a few months later, I left my position. I was a senior officer in banking. I left my career of 38 years to begin my research of my book. And I spent uh, eight years researching it and mm -hmm. and publishing it. And I had I reached out to 40 widowers from all different markets, uh, segments, uh, demographics, uh, conditions of the how the wife passed, and they were my subject matters. They were they tolerated me for eight years coming up with questions. They answered an eleven page single space questionnaire for me. I mean, I really went deep, and then I went and found professional staff like attorneys, psychologists, sociologists, medical doctors, uh, clergy, and I surrounded myself with them. And then I was able to publish the book in uh, three years ago. Uh, since that time, the book has become a play. And mm -hmm. it, it won Best New Play of the Year in upstate New York. It played at the Alleyway Theater in Buffalo. Wow. And it's, and oh, it's, wow. And it's called I'm Fine. And the, the name I'm Fine came from one of my subjects, one of the widower subjects, that um, he said, I asked him once, uh, what's the best thing that ever happened to you during your grief journey? And he said, when I told my family and friends, I'm fine, leave me alone with my thoughts. They ignored my instructions and forced their way into my life, and I'm so grateful they did. So anyhow, that became the play. Um, so that's how I lost my wife. And then I des decided that uh, I, I needed to do more. So I created the Widower's Support Network. And it has several different components in it. But the most popular one is my men's only Facebook page. So you have to apply um, and you have to be either a widower or a caregiver or a sympathetic man who wants to help those uh, those members. And I have over a thousand men that I care for and we give them content every single day. Um, and uh, let's see what else the um, that that's about it. I mean, I, I find that reaching out to the men gave me purpose. And men have to have purpose. Um, be, and I, in fact, I teach that, that you have to find that in yourself. Uh, and the men that I find that join my group come from really all walks of life. Um, they are PhDs, they are professors, they are uh, garbage men, they are unemployed. The conditions that their lives have died varied completely from childbirth to murder to suicide. I mean, we get the whole gamut. And what we do is we listen to them, we comfort them, and we encourage them. And we give them content like on Sundays, we will um, we, we will we pay respect to the Christian community. We also talk sports on Sunday. Um, on Mondays, we talk about money and your personal finance. On Tuesday, we have music, and we have columnists. I have nine columnists that write columns for me, and they are either authors of books or they're widowed or they're, they have a reason to be there. On, on Wednesdays, we talk about their health. Um, on, and more columnists, more columnists on Thursdays. On Fridays, we remember the Jewish faith. Um, 
we talk sports again on Thursday. On Saturday, we talk about um, handyman's corner and how to fix things around the house because so many men are capable of running a corporation, but they can't balance the checkbook. <laughs> right. They can't pay the paper boy. I mean, they are right. totally incompetent without a wife. Yeah. Um, and and it's especially especially if they if they grew up with a doting mother right. who met their every need and then she even went out and found him a doting wife and then she continued the saga well those guys are in deep trouble right. and we throw them a life raft <laughs> so um the and it's the most gratifying thing i've ever done Herb, that's amazing. I I just like to follow up. I'm not sure you know this. I I met Steve after my son Matt passed away. He passed away July 22nd, 2018, and I like you knew I had to do something. So my wife went on the internet and she said I got to find something, and she found Grief Share, and she goes, "What do you think?" I go, "I have no idea what that is." She goes, "Some guy Steve's running it." I go, "Shoot an email." and see if we can join. So, I mean, we were like two, three weeks after we lost Matt and we went there and I told the story before where Steve started the grief share by asking everybody if they had taken courses on grief. And again, I just lost my son and I go, of course I haven't taken a course on grief. And everybody else there was saying, no, we haven't taken a course on grief. Like who in the right mind would ever take a course on grief? You'd be insane. But we obviously know now that you will be needing a course on grief if you are a human living on this planet. Because either you're going to pass and people are going to grieve you, or you're going to live and your loved ones are going to pass. So what you're sort of saying is what Steve really began his course on grief share dealing with, that there is no course on grief and we really have to fill that void because there's such a need for it. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the way you did that because my journey is a little different than yours in the sense that you're a widower and I am lost my, my son. But my question before I turn to Steve is, do, do you have children? Do, do, do you have any sons, sons or daughters? Yes. Yeah. How many children do you have? I have four, but I've remarried. Okay, and so I have four stepchildren and my children. Okay. Um, and I have several grandchildren. How has their journey been different than yours? How, how has your children's journey been different than yours? Have you, have you incorporated their journey at all into your journey as a widower dealing with grief? Uh, am I incorporating I'm your, sorry. Ch your children's journey of grief? Oh. Have they been involved in your journey of grief as, as oh, a widower? Oh, um, yes, yeah, they are somewhat. Uh, you know, it's interesting you ask that because as I think about my father who was a widower, I feel embarrassed that I did not do more for him. Right, that's what I'm sort of getting at, right? The, 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 the different dynamics, the different journeys. I, I and, and he lived a long time. He lives 12 years later. And I, I just was not understanding enough. Um, but my, my, my children are all sympathetic. And they're all sensitive to it. And they all liked her. You know, so. Um, and my, my, my new wife is terrific. I mean, and, and I, I just hope that if there's an afterlife, that I'm going to have to introduce the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it'd be a nice dinner. Actually, actually, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Um, you have. Interesting. Um, so we did mention your book before her. Let's go ahead and tell everybody what the name of the book is so they can find it. Okay. In case they are interested in it. It's the widower's journey, um, and I had uh, a expert as at my oh, I, well among my various experts. I had a lead expert in a Dr. Deborah Carr, 
who is the head of the sociology department at Boston University, and she studied grief for 20 years. Hmm. So she was a real find for me to have available as a resource. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody had the name of the book in case they want to go find it and look for it, then they, they yeah. can find it. And it's available in in all digital formats. Um, so it's and so you can get it on Amazon.com. I, I found it on Amazon this morning when I was looking. Um, interesting enough, uh, Marshall mentioned Grief Share, and that's how I actually met you as well. So right, I remember uh, the night you came in. Yeah, I, that's when I was still writing the book and researching it, and I. I've heard so much about grief share that I wanted to go and experience it so I can speak to it intelligently. And um, it was great. It was great. It was helpful. Good. Good. Um, obviously, you didn't receive enough information as a new widower, and there were no books, so you actually wrote the first book on it. Why do widowers grieve differently? Is it because men are brought up differently with their grief? They're not supposed to show emotions. What did you find in that area? Um, men, <laughs> boy, I, I can be somewhat critical of my fellow man uh, when it comes to this topic because I think they don't really use their brains fully and they react um and i i find that they're like i mentioned before they're very dependent on the spouse if there is a spouse except there is a something that i did observe and that is people who have been in the military tend to fare better in dealing with grief because they have become they they understand structure they and men work better with structure uh, they understand that they that they have to get off the couch and get in the game to prevail. Um, they they have many of them have seen death in the past, uh, which also helps, and they. Um, I'm just I'm going I'm I'm thinking of too many things at one time here. Um, they they know how to live, I mean, and survive, and they can iron their own clothes, and they can cook their own meals, and they can uh, bandage up a wound where other men, it, mommy, where are you? I, I need this, I need that. And it's really sad to, to observe this in people. Uh, so there's some people who, like I said before, can run a corporation but can't balance the checkbook. There's also the emotional side. They go home and they, they tell people, I'm fine, leave me alone with my thoughts. In the darkened home with the curtains drawn, and they're really hoping that somebody knocks on the door or calls them. But with mm -hmm. the pandemic, right. we have what's called compound isolation. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's even worse. And it, Debbie, the Dr. Carr and I, we actually did a podcast about that ourselves a couple months ago about compound isolation. And it's it's dangerous, um, but it's the, it's the world that we live in, and for at least for the time being. Unfortunately, you're right. Herb, what do you think is normal for a widower to feel right after a loss? Because you know, men are different, and I, and I hear what you're saying, but there's also, you know. So much of, you know, I can tell you, growing up in Buffalo, as you mentioned, sports was always a big thing. And, you know, I just always remember, you know, playing sports and getting hurt. You know, you could have a huge gash in your leg, you know, put dirt on it and keep on playing. Like that's going to solve everything, you know, like you just tough it out and, and, and stay in the game, which when you're a kid and you're resilient, that's one thing. But when you're an adult and you lost, somebody you love it's something else so how does that factor into the grief of a widower the the widowers um i'm pardon me i'm just 
I'm um, can, uh, do you edit this? <laughs> uh, we usually don't because we no, let everybody okay. know th th we're just having a conversation right. and um, okay. It, I'm sorry. Um, so but, going going through the grief classes, we've learned there's certain things that you think you're going crazy and you find out it's actually normal to feel like that or to think <laughs> that way. So I, I think what Marshall and I were trying to get at is what are some of the things that you realize that were normal that at the time you didn't think was normal until you started doing your research for your book? And then you go, oh, wow, that 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 really is perfectly normal. Well, crying and grieving. Mm -hmm. And but men are embarrassed. Men have egos, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, one gentleman just wrote on my Facebook page the other day. I'm a PhD. I know better, and I'm still reluctant to cry in front of other people. You know, he's oh, wow. it, men, especially in the Western mm -hmm. Hemisphere, are reluctant to show their emotions in Europe and in Asia. It's not that big of a problem. But here, you know, we've become stoic and uh, we can't be seen hurting uh, because then you're going to think less of me. I mean, I, I'm sure that my boss uh, questioned my ability to perform at the bank with, during the period that I was grieving. I had the personnel director walked into my office, saw me sitting at my desk crying, closed the door, turned around and walked away. Didn't say a word. Didn't offer me oh, wow. anything. Now, if I was a girl, he probably would have said, oh, honey, are you okay? Do you want some tissue? Here's a glass of water. You know, it's there is a difference of our society on how we treat men. And that's why men don't ask for help. And they desperately need help. But they, especially in Buffalo or in the northern climates mm -hmm. during the winter, when the when the days are short and the nights are long and the weather is blistery, they are isolated for weeks on end. Yeah, you know, which is very true. dangerous. You said something about the crying part. I realized that Jordan only saw me cry once, and it was when we lost a pet when he was I don't know ten, ten and a half. He died at eleven and a half. I think I cried every day for two years, at, at least a couple minutes every day. And I'm like, wow, I never showed him that side of me. So you're exactly right. Until I lost him, I just, I wasn't supposed, you're supposed to be tough. You're supposed to be the, you're supposed to be able to show him the way. And it's like, I'm not sure what I showed him, probably what every other guy does, but. Yeah. yeah. And if you're candid, it will go on for years because grief doesn't have a natural cycle. Uh, it, it, you can have a good week, a good month, and then suddenly you crash. Uh, yeah. you, you have triggers mm -hmm. that, that, that create a memory, and then you go back and you suffer through that trigger. Uh, when I moved where I'm living now, I lived um, very close to here uh, 20 years ago with Michelle. Well, I could tell you the restaurant on um, Lake Mary Boulevard, what she wore the last time we were there. So every time I go by that restaurant, I can't help but think about it. You know, you, you just, yeah. and that's been tw 13 years. So um, it's, it's not going to be easy. Everybody expects the men to get back in the game. And that means... Ladies, that means I need to find a woman. And because I'm, men are fixers. I, I, Steve and I have been talking about this. Yeah. Men are fixers. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about my brother. My brother was on a plane with his wife. And his wife said to, leaned over and said to him, the little boy on the seat behind me is kicking the back of my seat. <laughs> Well, my brother, being a man, which means he's a fixer, mm -hmm. he turned around, saw the boy, and said, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, his wife leaned back over to him again and said, why'd you do that? 
And she said, well, you told me he was kicking your seat. He said, yes, he was. I didn't want you to do anything. I just want you to know it. <laughs> right. So, so men so are fixers. And when their wife is passed, they see themselves as broken. Mm -hmm. And I need to be whole. So th frequently they'll marry the first girl that they, they date. The first girl. It doesn't matter. Any, anybody. I mean... Uh, and their fatality rate of their marriages is over 50%. But the uh, the other thing that, that impacts uh, men is suicide. Because three to, or four to five percent, or, percent, or four to five times uh, of the suicide rate of women, men will commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And because they're so, they're so lost. They could have a great career, but they're still lost. So what most men do is they just bury themselves back into their jobs, like I did at four in the morning. It that's obviously, as I mentioned before, my son Matt died by suicide, and I'm very involved with the latest research and statistics. And I know you talked about the effect of the pandemic on grief. Well, they're doing a lot of statistical research now of the effect of the pandemic on suicide, and it is not good because, yeah. you know, with grief, you know, Steve and I have talked about this, like in the Jewish religion, you have a period called sitting Shiva where everybody comes over, friends, family, loved ones, and just sort of takes over the house for the grieving family, bringing food, and it's a very helpful way to begin the journey of grief you can't do that now with the, with the pandemic you can't have yeah. 50 people in your house bringing in food and everybody hugging and kissing and, and yeah. giving you emotional support so you already start off at a deficit to begin with and then you talked about being home with the curtains closed sitting by yourself that's social isolation that's social distancing it's what you have to do now with the pandemic and it's horrible for grief and it's horrible for what effect it's having on people, including suicide, because they are showing that statistically the suicide numbers this year compared to last year and the year before and the year before are in fact higher. And they're trying to uh, obviously make the connection that is the pandemic causing this? And it would sure the heck seem like there's a causal relationship there. And I, I think with men being the stoic and tough guys they were supposed to be, we just compound that. No question. It's, yeah, no, no question. Now, there's some tools that are out there that are available for such cases, like take them a meal. Are you familiar with that? No. It's a, it's a software program. It's an online, takethemameal.com, and you can schedule uh, so that you don't get all the meals at one day and then nothing for the next month. And it, and it ladders them, it spaces them out, and you can you can send it out to a bunch of relatives, and then those who are in a position to help can take a day and say what they're going to bring. So it, there's there's some tools out there, and Zoom and right. you know, is a big big. I can't imagine being in a pandemic without Zoom. It would be even more hurtful and more damaging. It, it would, absolutely. And, you know, I think we need human contact in any way, shape, or form you can get it. You know, is this as good as a hug? Of course not. But it's better than isolation. Yeah. That's what that's where you got to look at it. Yeah. I've, I've thought about my daughter who is single, and I've actually con congratulated her that she is trying very hard, but she's living alone. So she has very little contact with other humans. So I'm right now practicing high touch, you know, daily messages, phone calls, you know, anything, mm -hmm. gifts, you know, anything to break up her day for her. Right. How, how, how old's your daughter? Oh, she's in her 40s. Mm -hmm. And she works up at the University of Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, it's, again, I think the effect of the pandemic 
on society in general and people in grief in particular is going to be profound that we may not even know the true permanent effect of it for years or maybe even decades. This is going to have a big, big effect. You know, you think about this. When was the last time people couldn't grieve normally? 100 years ago during the 1918 flu yeah. pandemic. It's been 100 years, not in our lifetime. Yeah. And so this is uncharted territory. It really is. It's tough. It's tough. It really, really is. What? I, I know that you also have a podcast, right? I guess we're doing now. Yes. What What made you want to do a podcast? I'm, I'm interested in that because uh, obviously we're doing that to try to help as many people as you can in the grief process. But what was, what was your thought process with your podcast? Uh, the the men are of different ages, mm -hmm. and, you know, and over half of them are under 50. So do they have different preferences and communications? So I wanted to be sure that I was reaching them. Uh, so I created the podcast and um, we have a one that's coming up. I did one this afternoon um, earlier today, but I'm, I have one coming up uh, with this gentleman on Monday. And he wrote the book, My Wife Said You May Want to Marry Me. His oh, name yeah. is Jason Rosenthal. And his wife wrote an essay saying uh, that appeared in the New York Times and it's in 2017 and she, the header was you may want to marry my husband and then she died 10 days later well he's done a TED talk and uh, he's speaking now he's a lawyer by trade he's in Chicago and so you know we're, we go out and we find people like him that we can interview that we have something that we can learn from uh, and share it with my audience and I hope that they, my audience re listens to my podcast, uh, like when they're driving their cars or whatever. And also the reach. I mean, I, I'm in 26 countries with my podcast. Wow. Uh, so my audience has expanded. And I also write a newspaper or a column. In fact, here's one right here. I write for 22,000 um, funeral directors. And, and so my column appears there and it appears in India uh, with some organization over there and open to hope in California. Um, the, the, the widowers or um, the grief toolbox in New Hampshire. I, I, you know, I get around using different channels. It's fantastic. How did you navigate the technology? I'm very impressed that you're, that you're able to do all that. Seriously. I, I'm a little bit younger than you, and it sounds like you've really taken this head on with enormous amount of energy and enthusiasm. Seriously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. Steve and I have been doing this podcast together, but Steve is far more advanced te technologically than I am. I'm a lawyer, but from a technological standpoint, I, I kid my uh, secretary. She's been with me for 32 years. I said we practice. Fred Flintstone law. I know what I know, and I know how to do that. And I don't want to go too, too far afield, but it sounds like you've taken your grief and really channeled that into learning new things and experiencing new things to try to help others. Uh, I'm, I have been blessed in my career. Uh, I started off in banking, repossessing cars, and I ended up as a bank president. Mm -hmm. And along that, that path, I was, I was held many marketing and sales positions, government relations positions, and the collective skills that were needed for those positions is what I'm using to do what I do today. Had I not had my career, I could not even attempt what I do today. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful for what my job taught me. Um, and it's, a, it's the best thing that I've ever done. 
It's very, very gratifying. There's not a day that goes by that somebody doesn't write a post or call me or send me a note saying how much it means to them, how much they are dependent upon, you know, my the various tools that I make available to them. I have a professor at um, Brigham Young University who is single. No, he's married. He's not a widower, but he became familiar with me i don't know how but he did and he called me up one day he's like he's he's like 40 years old um and he's a f professor there and he said i i teach computers and how would you like me to redesign your website for you and i'll use my students sure you know have at it so I, so I get a lot of help from the the gentlemen who become familiar with my work and they like my journalists, the guys who write the columns for me. I couldn't fill all those column inches, but they do it and they do a great job. And they come up with topics that I never even would have thought of. Uh, so it's um, it's a labor of love. It's it's I I sometimes think that my my void of not helping my father more. I'm giving forward. Um, and I'm, I'm actually concerned that my health is going to come into play. And so I'm looking for a place that I can partner with or make some kind of special arrangements with. But because I know that the men are dependent upon me. Uh -oh. and, fr and frankly, for widowers, my Facebook page is the best thing on the planet. I mean, there is nothing else out there for widowers. You may find widowers and widows, but nothing just for widowers. So we, uh, once, once people become familiar with us, they become fans. That's fantastic. I mean, seriously, that, that speaks so well of you that you were willing to Help, help so many people you had the will to do it and the ability to succeed at that goal is fantastic i Thank mean you. that's how let me ask you this how does it help you when you have a tough day when you're getting hit by that wave of grief how when people, reaching, when people are reaching out to you for help how do you deal with it when it's your day to look for help when you're getting hit by that wave of grief, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to Steve about this many times. I've always said that over time, Matt's only been gone for two years now, the wave, the waves of grief become less frequent over time, but the wave height never changes. It's like when you get hit, it's like you just lost your loved one. And so what I'm asking you is you've got so many people looking to you for help when they're dealing with their wave of grief what do you do when you get hit with your wave of grief do you reach out to them or do you do other things um that's a good question um you, you know just when when i post things i do it um to satisfy some of my own grief mm -hmm. issues but I put it up anonymously. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, they know it's coming from me, but it, they don't know it's my issue. <laughs> and then they will answer. Um, and, and frankly, the, the men are so active on this page mm -hmm. that there's always something interesting that's going on. Um, they, they talk about their girlfriends. They talk about if they got engaged or like on Fridays, we only allow good news. No, no, no tear jerking post, no, no crying, no, no sorrow, no grief, only good news on Fridays. And they, they save it up during the week so they can post it on Fridays. And mm -hmm. it, it could be that they did something with the grandchildren uh, last Labor Day weekend. Uh, or they been able to overcome something that has been a hurdle for them, uh, grief-wise or health-wise or whatever it is. 
So I, I, I'm nurtured. I'm, it's therapeutic for me. There's no doubt about it. Writing my book was very therapeutic for me. I almost quit, I should tell you, writing the book. And the book is, is, it still earns five stars on Amazon. It still gets very good reviews. But I, I almost quit about 12 times. And I'm a Catholic, and I was in church, and I said a silent prayer. I was, I was at my wit's end, and this is like eight years in. <laughs> wow. And tr trying to lead volunteers for eight years, you know, the men who, oh, it's Herb again. He's got more questions. Um, the experts, keeping them engaged. And is he ever going to finish this book? <laughs> um, I actually wrote 102,000 words, but I only published 59 because we wanted the book to be really a lot of red meat. And I was in church and I said, God, if you really want this book, you're going to have to send me a sign. Well, the pastor gets up and does a homily that was custom made for my ears. And I thought to myself, okay, I'll give you the book. And six months later, it was released. Wow. So, so I told the pastor that he saved that book. Well, again, also, I, can't... I I should tell you my current wife saved the book. Because I could not have written it without her support. And the number of hours that I put into the book, I mean, you're talking thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. And I got binders and binders of research and questionnaires and et cetera and tabulations. Um, my wife is a very giving person, my current wife, and she enabled me to write the book. And she's my biggest fan. Right. That's that's wonderful. Again, I, I'm I'm just so impressed because I I'm looking at what you've done. You've you've written a book. You've set up a support network. You've got a podcast. I mean, you're like a one man band. I mean, seriously, those guys with the all the instruments and doing everything at once. I. Uh, it, I think it just is a good roadmap because anybody that loses a loved one, you want to make your life a tribute to theirs. Yeah. By making the world a better place the way they did when they were here. They're not here anymore, so we have to do it. And it sure the heck sounds like you're really doing a very good job with that. I'm um, I'm a man of faith, and I've been blessed more than I deserve, as they say. And I need to, I owe others. So I'm just trying to fulfill that obligation. Well, I think you're succeeding. And again, I can't um, tell you how much I'm impressed by what you're doing. And Thank you. I've always said the people from Buffalo are the best in the world, and you, <laughs> you're, you're proving this. You're proving that with what you're doing. Seriously, you know what's funny about the city of Buffalo is you go to a Topps Market or a or, <laughs> or a Wegmans, and you will talk to people who pass you with a shopping cart. You'll talk to them. You know, yeah. you know, where could I find this or what? But in the South, if you're in a Publix or a Win Dixie, you don't dare talk to anybody because it's an affront to them. <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting you mention that my my father grew up in Buffalo, but my mother grew up on the Lower East Side of, of Man Manhattan. If you know Katz's Delicatessen, the famous Delicatessen in New York, she grew up right across the street in First Street and Avenue Way. My my grandfather was a Russian immigrant and was a tailor, and he went bankrupt during the Depression. He had eight children, and he had to work as a New York City sanitation man, a garbage man. He made $36 a week, and he had to feed 10 
people on $36 a week. So my mother moved to Buffalo after my father um, finished podiatry school. My father was, was a foot surgeon. And she moved to Buffalo, and she didn't even know where Buffalo was. She, 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 you know, she knew it was someplace west of the Hudson, but she didn't know where it was. <laughs> and she told me so many times that her best friends in her entire life were people from Buffalo. They meant more to her than any of the friends she made in her entire life. So yeah. She was a New Yorker, but she became a Buffalonian. Yeah. And I've had so many people tell me that. And yeah. it's just a mentality. You know, I, again, I love the T-shirts in Buffalo where it says, Buffalo, the city of no illusions. That sort of, <laughs> that, that, that sort of says it. it is what it is. And it's Buffalo okay. and it's family and it's football and it's chicken wings and it's a sense of community that I think we all need now. So obviously it's, all the good things you've done, I think your Buffalo background has led you to where you that, are. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for talking today. And I want to thank you so much for doing what you're doing and giving so much of yourself to those who need help. And I think just think being a guest on our podcast today will help others that you may not have been able to reach through your wonderful activities. And I think this will be a wonderful thing to try to help others. And again, I, I just cannot tell you how impressed I am by everything you've done and everything that you are doing. And um, just keep up the good work. It's wonderful. Well, thank you. If I can just say if, sure. for gentlemen who are listening to this podcast, uh, to get on the page of our Facebook page, uh, go to Widowers Support Network members only. Now we have two pages. We have Widowers Support Network for the general public. And then we have Widowers Support Network members only just for men. So I mean, and it's for a free service. So we invite them to uh, check us out. Great, great. I hope all our listeners will, will do that. And again, I want to thank you so much for being a guest today. It was a very interesting conversation. I always love talking to anybody from Buffalo. And <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I do. I just, I love it. And um, off camera, off camera and off uh, uh, mic, we were talking about our favorite places to eat in Buffalo. And I'm, I think we better leave it there because if we start talking about Buffalo food, we'll be doing this podcast for the next six hours. So we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave that off. Okay. Off, off audio and off video. But again, thank you so much for being here. And I, I know you really helped a lot of our listeners today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.